Amen. Please be seated. It is good to see all of you here this day. And as we continue our consecutive expositions through the book of Ephesians, I invite you please to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, as we come to take up for today the theme of divine power. Ephesians 1, as we continue to consider Paul's glorious petition for the Ephesians, having already told us in this section of scripture in verses 17 and 18, that he prayed for the Ephesians so that they would have a deeper experiential knowledge of God's person and promises. Now in verses 19 and 20 of this chapter, Paul prayed that they would have the same thing concerning God's power toward us, his people. Notice these verses with me then in your Bibles. Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20. Here Paul says that he's praying to God for these Christians and all other Christians after them that they may know, look at verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Brethren, let's once again pray and ask the Lord's blessings upon our time. Let's pray together. Our great God, we are so thankful for the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath. So thankful for this one in seven where we could separate ourselves from the things of our regular concern and Focus upon you and your glory, your word, your truth, and your gospel. Oh God, we thank you for the wisdom of this day. And we thank you, oh God, even as we considered in the earlier hour that the Apostle John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Oh Lord, we pray, therefore, that we also would be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That we would be helped by the Spirit animated by the Spirit, filled by the Spirit, and taught by the Spirit. Oh God, we look to you this morning as your needy children and are asking that you would give us grace. We're asking that you would give us help from on high. We're asking, oh God, that you would rend the heavens and speak for your servants listen. Do us good, we pray, O oh precious Lord. We ask and plead all these things in your own wonderful and holy name. Amen. Amen. Now it has been correctly said that the religion we profess as Christians is a religion of power. In fact, dear Brothers and sisters here this day, Christianity is a religion of omnipotent power. It is a religion of vast power and transforming power, which is so powerful that it makes sinners into saints, rebels into righteous people, and lost individuals to become true lovers of Jesus Christ our Lord, blessed be his name. Now, if ever people needed anything in their lives, to be sure, dear ones, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. I mean, if the lost who are bound, who are held fast in their sins are ever going to be changed, then they definitely need the power of God at work in them. And for us who are saved and have been changed through the gospel, which according to Paul in Romans chapter 1 and uh, verse 16 is, quote, the power of God unto salvation, then brethren, we also need that power in order to make us more and more like our lovely and living Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for this morning, we have before us a passage which speaks directly, 
uh, speaks right to this topic of the power of God. In fact, this is a subject which the Apostle Paul deals with throughout this entire epistle, highlighting to us its effect for both saint and sinner alike. Now regarding saints, that is to say us in this place who are saved by the grace of God, I believe that the topic of the power of God is especially important for us to understand. And I say this because sometimes in our lives, even as God's children, we can feel a bit powerless. We can feel and find it hard to imagine that we could ever be better and do better as the redeemed. Another one, in other words, dear ones, at times, you and I can feel that all we can do is just slog along so that our Christian walk becomes more of a stumble than a stride. Now, while not at all negating that at times as believers, you and I will certainly stumble and sin will get the upper hand in our lives, yes. However, church, I'm convinced nonetheless that this should not be the main pattern of our lives. While again, and hear me clearly, we will mess up and we will feel spiritually ineffective at times to do all that God calls us to do, either in our hearts or in our homes, etc. Nonetheless, brethren, this is not God's great design in our lives. This is not God's great plan. And why? Well, it's because according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37, God would have us to be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. He would have us to be strong as his people. Consequently, this is why we're told, for example, in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32, that the people who know their God shall be what? Well, he doesn't say shall be weak, no, but rather he says the people who know their God shall be strong and perform great exploits. Ah, but having said this, we ask, how does all of this come to pass in our lives? I mean, is there some magical formula in this regard or some higher life experience that we should seek out as believers? Well, church, not at all. Rather, Paul here, in our passage in view for today, teaches us that by virtue of being Christians, we already have dynamic spiritual power in order to live as God would have us to live. Now, of course, in saying this, this is not to say that God never empowers us afresh for various things in our lives, because he certainly does. Ah, but dear ones here this day, here in our verse for this morning, in the words of Lloyd-Jones, that excellent preacher from another generation, he says that Paul is praying not that the Ephesians may have more power, no, but rather that they may come to know the greatness of the power that God is already working in them. Well, dear ones, I absolutely believe that Lloyd-Jones is correct in this and that this is what the Apostle Paul wants you and I always to remember. This is what he wants us never to forget. This, my dear brother, my dear sister here this day, is what the Apostle wants you to be aware of, wants me to be aware of. And so as we come to know and be assured of this in our lives, notice with me first for today the manifestation of this power as put forth in verse 19 of this chapter. Here, as the Apostle begins to speak 
about his prayer in this regard back in verse 18 of this chapter, and I'll read to verse 19 in your hearing. Ephesians 1 at verse 18, he says, look at the words in your Bibles, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, I opened it up for you last week, to what end? He says that, the word that, giving us the content of what he wants us to see, that you may know, or better translated, truly comprehend and realize what is the hope of his calling, number one. Secondly, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And then third, follow with me, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, these opening words here in verse 19 of this chapter concerning the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe are really quite striking. They're gripping. And I say this because according to Scripture, the exceeding greatness, or we could say the immeasurable and surpassing magnitude of God's power toward us who believe has been and will be manifested to us in at least three ways in our lives. Three ways, and I want to flesh out these three ways for you this morning for a few minutes together from our Bibles. And so firstly, brethren, and quite clearly, God's immeasurable, God's surpassing power was manifested toward us the very moment he saved our never dying souls. I mean, church, when God made us Christians, what were we before that? Well, before that, we were spiritually powerless people who, as Paul says in chapter 2 and verse 1 of this book, were, quote, dead, powerless in our trespasses and sins. I mean, beloved, at that time, we weren't just bruised and broken, no. And we weren't just underprivileged and disadvantaged, no. But rather, the Bible says that you and I were dead. We're dead, spiritually speaking. We were, as Paul says in Ephesians 4 and verse 18, quote, alienated from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance which was within us, and this is because of the blindness of our hearts oh yes beloved church here this day at that time you and i were in a very bad a very sad spiritual condition until god came until he came to us through the gospel telling us about the good news of his son the lord jesus christ who in love died on the cross for our sins and made a full, a free, and a final atonement to God for them, spiritually speaking, you and I were in the world without God, having no hope. Ah, but once again, when our great and merciful God came to us through the gospel, by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, I say, church, he made us alive. I say that he quickened us from the dead. And this so that we could see our desperate need of deliverance in Christ and his willingness to save us. And then what happened? Well, what happened was by his grace we called out to him to do this very thing for us. Namely, save us. And then guess what? He saved us forevermore. Praise be to his name. Oh, but having said this, the point is, all of this, of which I just spoke, all of it was first connected to the exceeding greatness of God's saving power 
toward us. It was all connected to his initial work in us. Thus, this is why, for example, in this place, we do not believe that salvation is something that unsaved people do for themselves, no, but rather, we believe that salvation is holy of the Lord. Can anyone say amen? Yes, brethren, we believe that it's all of God. It's all of Him, who according to Paul in Romans chapter 4, quote, gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as if they did. In fact, beloved ones here this morning, when Paul says here in our passage, look at the language, that we are to know what is the exceeding, exceeding greatness, the surpassing, immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us, quote, who believe, we must remember that even our faith, even our belief in Christ is a gift from God, right? I mean, even our ability to trust in Jesus Christ alone for life and salvation is that which God gave us in regeneration. Consequently, this is why, for example, Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, look at the words with me there in your Bibles. He says, Ephesians 2 at verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, which is to say that grace and that salvation and that faith, and that is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. Well, this then is the fact of the matter. This is the case, consequently, this is why Paul says in verse 10a of this chapter, look at the words with me there in your Bibles, he says that in view of all that he just wrote in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, not only we are our own workmanship, as our Arminian friends want to tell us, no, but rather he says in view of the fact that it's all of God, verse 10a, he says that we are God's workmanship. Well, Secondly, then, I say that the exceeding greatness of God's surpassing power toward us who believe is that which is being manifested toward us in our sanctification. In our sanctification. Now, what is sanctification? Well, in quoting the great Westminster Shorter Catechism, there, the excellent Puritan divines say that, quote, sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. In fact, church, whereas justification in our salvation is that which is outside of us happening in the courtroom of heaven and declares us saved once for all time from sin's penalty. Sanctification, however, is that which is in us and it continues to save us from sin's power all of our days. And so the question to ask now is, how are we saved from sin's penalty on an ongoing basis? How is this so? Well, the answer of the Bible is by God's omnipotent power that works in us who believe. You see, beloved, in sanctification, our great God works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure by the power of the Holy Spirit as we work out what he works in. And so you see, just as God exercised his great, surpassing, supreme, sovereign, omnipotent power in our salvation, so also in like manner, so that you and I can have real success over inward corruption and daily struggles. Our God does the same thing through the process of sanctification. 
My church, having said these things, I must say, or ask, aren't they encouraging? Isn't this glorious? Well, it certainly is. And this is something that we need to know. And of course, these Ephesians needed to know this as well. In fact, concerning these Ephesians, you should note that in their lives, before they were converted, they very much knew about a power at work in them. Ah, but church, this power wasn't God's divine power, no. Rather, it was Satan's demonic power. It was the devil's power, which, as Paul says in Ephesians 2 and verse 2, now works in the sons of disobedience. Ah, but after they were saved, they now had a brand new power at work in them. And that brand new power was one that was much stronger than any demonic power that they had previously experienced. And so again, this is the point of what Paul wants them to realize with reference to God's great power in their lives, in their present day sanctification. He wanted them to know about what he speaks of in chapter 3 and verse 20 of this book when he writes there saying, now to him, that is to God, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, and Paul says, and this, quote, according to the power that works in us. Uh, but having said these two things in reference to our past salvation and then secondly in the present in our sanctification, you should also note now thirdly that the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe is that which will one day be manifested, be realized toward us in the future in our glorification. In our glorification. Well, what then is glorification all about? Well, glorification is, simply stated, the final step in the application of salvation. Simply stated, glorification is the completion of God's work of salvation and sanctification in us. And it happens when Jesus returns and raises the bodies of all believers who died and then unites those bodies to their glorified souls. And then he changes the bodies of all believers who remain alive thereby giving all Christians at the same time perfect resurrected bodies like unto his own. In fact, beloved, Paul even speaks about this matter in Philippians 3 and verse 21 when he says there that Christ will, quote, transform our lowly body. To what end? He says that it might be conformed to his glorious body. How's it done? He tells us, quote, according to the working, according to the energy, according to the surpassing greatness of God's power, by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. And so, this then is the heart of the matter at hand concerning the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe put forth broadly and biblically speaking. Now, of course, having said this, perhaps the surpassing greatness of God's power toward us who believe is most practically and usefully understood in connection to this whole matter of our present day sanctification, our present day sanctification, and this is how I believe the Ephesians would have understood Paul's words here. Now why do I say this? Well, I do so because this is where you and I as Christians live. This is where the Ephesians live, right? We currently live between our salvation, initially begun, and our future glorification. Between those two poles we have what is called sanctification, as I mentioned. Yes, brethren, right now all of us who are true Christians 
find ourselves in the process of being sanctified. And so, dear ones, I say that the real practical point from our passage here this morning is that in the midst of all that we have to face in life, we are not without strength to do well in it. We are, are not powerless as the case once was when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. No, but rather, because we are now saved, God's great power is mighty at work in us so that by His grace we have His divine enablement in order to live as He would have us to live. And so you see, my dear brother, my dear sister here this day, please know that right now, right now, you have divine enablement at your disposal already in you by virtue of being a child of God in order to live for Him. Yes, right now, hear me clearly, you have God's inherent power within so that, for example, right now you can have victory over sin. Right now, you can be a godly husband. Right now, you could be a godly wife. Right now, you could be a godly child. Right now, you can be a godly employer or employee. And right now, you could be a godly churchman or churchwoman, etc. And so, in view of all these things, I say to you, beloved ones here this day, if you feel yourself weak or inadequate in any particular area of your life, then remember that you, in fact, can rely upon God's power, which is exceedingly great toward you. I say, friends, that you are to recall that God has not left you as a redeemed child without strength for success. No. For as Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, quote, God's divine power has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, having said this, notice with me next that Paul says here in our verse that all of this exceeding great power toward us who believe is quote according to or we could say in line with the working of God's mighty power and so you ask pastor V what's the point you ask what is Paul stressing here well what he's stressing is that what God has given you and me who are Christians in salvation it's not minimal, no, but rather it's mighty. That's his point. It's according to, the Greek word kata. It's along the line with God's mighty power. Paul here is stressing in our passage that it's great and that it's exactly what we need while living in this present evil age. Well, in view of this, I must say, dear ones, isn't our God gracious? Isn't he kind in giving such help like this to us, his beloved people? I mean, again, not only does he in salvation take out our hearts of stones and give us hearts of flesh, and not only one day will he perfect us in glorification, ah, but right now in the present time, in our sanctification, he gives us who believe aid according to his mighty power. Yes, according to Ephesians 3 and verse 16, God grants us to be, quote, strengthened with his might through his spirit. Where? The prepositional phrase answering the question, in the inner man. Right now, Ephesians 3.16, God has granted you 
strength by his might through the Spirit in the inner man. Well, having spoken then of the manifestation of God's divine power toward us who believe, Paul goes on secondly in verse 20 of this chapter to give us his illustration, his illustration. Here, as he wants us not only to know that God works powerfully toward us who believe, but also to show us what this power looks like, he says concerning it in verse 20 of this chapter, look at the words with me again in your Bibles, he says, that God's mighty power is that which he, that is God the Father, worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now, in this particular verse in view, all the way down to verse 23 of this chapter, the apostle speaks about the various ways in which God's great power has been put forth, and this specifically in connection to his positioning of his wonderful son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, in doing this, clearly Paul gives us the supreme analogy in this regard. And as he does this, he speaks about it in four particular ways concerning Jesus in the rest of these verses. And this firstly, if you're taking notes, with reference to Jesus' resurrection from the dead, 20a of this chapter. Secondly, in connection to Jesus' cosmic enthronement, in 20b to verse 21 of this chapter. Third, he does this in connection to Jesus' dominion as king, in verse 22a of this chapter. And then fourthly and finally, he does this in connection to Jesus' supremacy over all things in verses 22b to 23 of this chapter. And of course, we'll consider all of these things one at a time in the days ahead. However, for the time that remains for today, we're just going to see this whole matter of God's exceeding, great, surpassing power toward us who believe in connection to Jesus' resurrection, which, as most of you will know, I'm sure, was the validation of his completed work on behalf of his people on the cross of Calvary. Now, the apostle makes this connection clearly in 20a of this chapter. When again, in speaking about God's magnificent power toward us who believe, he says, look at the language, that it's according to, or again, in line with, the Greek word kata, once again, it's in line with the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now, in just looking at these words before us now, I must say, dear ones, they're really quite remarkable. <laughs> I mean, again, they're striking, as with what we read earlier. I mean, while I trust that we all know that along with Jesus involved in his own literal bodily resurrection from the grave, as he speaks of in John 10, and that the Holy Spirit was also involved in this great work, as we're told in Romans chapter 8, here we see in our verse that God the Father was also involved in this great event. We see that the first person of the Holy Trinity definitely worked in this regard. Consequently, Paul could say plainly in Galatians 1 and verse 1 that, quote, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Ah, uh, But in sticking to our point in hand for today, Paul here is saying in our passage, as remarkable as it may seem, that this energetic power, which is a good way to translate the words, which was exerted by the Father toward Christ in this regard, that is to say, his resurrection from the dead, in some way, in some shape or form, is now available to us as believers for all that we have to face in life. What is Paul speaking about here? Well, he's speaking about a resurrection power, which he teaches us is, in fact, at work in Christians by 
virtue of the fact that they have been saved and filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit. Listen then to Reformed Bible commentator Rick Phillips. You all know Rick Phillips. He's preached from this pulpit before. I've quoted him several times already in our expositions to this book. Rick comments on this matter. He says here that according to Paul in our passage, God's power for Christians is not merely, quote, like the power that raised Jesus from the grave. No. But it is, quote, the very power that did this. Again, as I say, remarkable language. Striking language. Rick says, quote, this resurrection power continues to work in the believer's life toward the goal of Christ-like and God-honoring holiness. Well, again, as I've said a couple times already, all of this is really quite remarkable. And brethren, this fact here, this passage in view and the other ones I've quoted throughout Ephesians, they highlight to us the very thing that I said in the outset of the message. What was it? I said that the religion that we profess as Christians is a religion of power. It's a religion of power. It's a religion which, for those who have been truly affected by it, gives them spiritual strength and vitality by the enabling of the Holy Spirit and this in order to live as God would have them to live. Well, here there then is where we end the exposition of our passage in view for today. And so as I begin to wind down, I want to make some applications for all of you here this day. And so firstly, I'll speak to you here this day who are professing Christ in this place. To you who claim to be true Christians, I want to say three things. And the first is, since Paul prays here in our passage that you may ex experientially know and comprehend what is the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe, in line with the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, I ask you, my dear professing believer here this day, are you comprehending and experiencing this power in your life? Application. Let's bring it home. This is what Paul says is true for true believers. Again, not negating, as I said in the outset of the message, that at times we'll fall, we'll stumble. Of course, it's all true. But as a pattern of your life, dear believer, are you comprehending and experiencing a new power by God to live as God would have you to live? I ask, have you rightly understood that you, in fact, are a new man, a, a new woman in Christ who is no longer bound to sin, no longer bound to self, no longer bound to Satan? Therefore, by the power invested in you by God Almighty as a Christian, you can now live as a new creation in Christ Jesus. I ask you, for those of you here this day who profess Christ, have you understood this? Well, I say that as you do, and as you walk in that great strength, which God has already implanted in you by virtue of the new birth, that then you will find more and more triumph in your life as a believer. Again, we're no longer dead in our trespasses and sins. We're no longer shackled. We're no longer old men and old women. No, we are new men and new women in Christ. And because that's the case, we have God's inherent power within us, which works mightily. I say, church, you will find that you will be more and more enabled 
to look at your trials in life and say to them that because I am a Christian who is in union with Christ, that by his grace, I can now live as he wants me to live in any situation. And this is because God's resurrection power is mightily at work in my life. This is similar to Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 6, is it not? It is. You've been crucified with Christ. Your old man is dead and buried away. Live as new man. Live as new woman. Because you are a new man. You are a new woman. And throughout Romans chapter 6, Paul keeps using the same word that's in our passage today. Know ye not. Know ye not. Know ye not. Don't you know? Don't you know? You're no longer the old man. No longer the old woman. You're a new person. You're a new creation from head to toe. The Holy Spirit is in you. God's mighty power energizes you to live as he would have you to live. Know this, my dear brother, my dear sister, this day. We need to have this awareness and live accordingly. Ah, but secondly then, I say, dear friends, that if you find yourselves weak here this day, and defeated in some particular area of your life, feeling a bit powerless, as Christians do from time to time, I say then, pray to God that he would empower you afresh, that he would give you fresh strength. Yes, ask him to do this for you. And why? Well, the answer is because with God, there are no power shortages. The answer is because with God there are no power outages. Therefore I say, cry out to him saying, Lord, this thing or that thing keeps getting the upper hand in my life. This sin or that sin. Therefore I say to you, with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 and verse 10, Oh God, help me to know more and more of, quote, the power of his resurrection. Philippians 3.10, Paul says what? That I may know. Paul, don't you know it already? Of course he knew it already. He says, I want to know more of it in my life experientially. I want to know the power of that resurrection working in my heart. Brethren, may we know the same. Thirdly then, to you here this day, who profess to be Christians in this place, let me say to you, dear ones, and listen carefully, let me say to you that if you find in your life that you absolutely have no real power to walk in victory over sin, how? In a gospel, rather, in a pattern of gospel holiness, whereby you are regularly hating your sins, repenting of your sins, fighting against your sins, and walking with the Savior, etc. If you are finding in your life that you absolutely have no power in this regard, then maybe, just maybe, you're not saved. Just maybe, you're not saved. I mean, friends, if your life looks more like the life of a non-Christian, then a true Christian, then maybe, just maybe, it's because you're a non-Christian. And so what's the application for you here this day? Well, simply this. Stop professing to be saved and get saved today. No victory over sin. No real love for Christ. No fighting against sin. Just a, a bare profession of faith. Friends, it's not a bare profession of faith that we need. What we need is a lively possession of Christ. And so if you're here this day and I'm speaking to you, you just say, I'm completely powerless in my life. I call myself a Christian, but there's no victory over sin. There's no real vital walking with Christ, friend. Stop saying you're a Christian and ask God to save you. Ask him to make you a real Christian, to change your heart. And this so that your life will look like someone, not who's perfect, no, but someone who is purposefully pursuing Jesus in all things. Oh, friend, may that be you here this day. May it be you here this day. 
And it is important when we preach the Word of God, not only to preach to believers and non-believers alike, but also to understand that when, when we preach, when pastors preach, there are those oftentimes in our midst who are self-deceived. Right? They profess Christ. But there's no evidence that they are in possession of Him. Look at they're religious, but there's no evidence that they're in a relationship with Jesus. I mean, these are the people that will stand before Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. Not just a few, no. He said, many will say to me in that day, Kurios, Kurios, Lord, Lord, Master, Master. Oh, they were in church like our church. They knew Jesus is the Lord. They read James 2 and knew that they should do many things for his name's sake. As Pastor Jack read, don't we do this? Don't we do that? They call him the right name. They sought to do works for him. All the rest. And what did Jesus say to them? Not, I never saw you, no. He saw them. But he said, I never knew you. Experiential knowledge. Experiential acquaintance. I never knew you. Oh, you made a good profession in the church, all the rest. But you weren't born again. Are you born again? I ask you, my dear listener here this day. Born again with the evidence that you love Christ. And that you love all of his people. Ephesians 1, we saw it earlier some months ago. These Ephesians, they had two distinct traits about them. Number one, they had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they loved all the saints. What about those saints who don't come in with suits on every Sunday? Well, we read it from James 2, didn't we? They're not all that they should be. Guess what, friend? One time you were not all that you should be. In fact, you'll never be all that you should be until heaven. So stop showing partiality and show some love. And so again, if you're a Christian here this day, I know, I know in my own life that you've got power over sin. You don't have complete victory. No, complete victory is for heaven. But you know that by God's grace, you're not the person you used to be, right? You're not that person anymore. That person who used to just love their sins, live in their sins. That person who used to drink in iniquity like water, like Job says. Now you don't drink in iniquity like water. Now you hate iniquity. You hate sin. When you sin, you feel bad. You repent. You look to Christ for fresh mercy and grace. If that's you, my friend, you're a Christian. That's what Christians do. But the false professor doesn't really feel guilty for sin, doesn't repent of sin, doesn't look to Christ when he or she sins. No! They just go on professing Christ without any fruit thereunto. And so, just in view of our passage for today, again I say, if your life looks more like a non-Christian than a true Christian, repent of your sins. Be unmasked this day. There's going to be a great day of unmasking. Again, Matthew chapter 7. I'd rather be unmasked today than on the final day of judgment and hear those most terrible words. Depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. I saw you, but I never knew you. You were never truly born again. My spirit was not in you. You didn't feel conviction of sin. You didn't repent when you sinned. You never humbled yourself. You, you just, you're just religious. You need to be in a relationship with Jesus. And guess what happens when you are? Everyone's going to know it. You're going to know it. It's going to be a shock to yourself. You'll look at yourself in the mirror. You'll be an anomaly to yourself. You'll say, why do I love going to church? Why do I love singing these songs? Why do I love these people? What has happened to me? God's made me a Christian. I'm a new creation. Now I love Jesus and I want to follow him. That's the last thing that I would imagine all of us would want to do while we were in our unsaved state. But now we want to follow him. Now we love him. We praise him. We tell others about him. We love him who loved us and gave himself for us. Oh, we don't love him as we ought, as the hymn writer says, but we love him nonetheless. Amen. We love him. We want to serve him. We want to give our all for him. Is this you, my dear professing Christian here this day? If it is, then don't unchristian yourself, no. 
But if none of these things are resonating with your heart now, in the language of Paul, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. I'm telling you that becoming a Christian is something supernatural. It's an amazing transformation. So that you could do things that you would never think you could do. Your disposition towards sin and the Savior have completely changed. That's what a Christian is. He or she, they're a miracle. That's God's great miracle in this age. It's called the new birth. And when you experience it, your life is changed forevermore. And so again, if your life has not been changed, again, not a perfect walk, but a purposeful walk. Well, your great desire, goal, and aim is to please Jesus in all things. Oh, but I stumble, I fall. We all do. The good that I would, that I don't do. The evil that I would not want to do, that I do. You're a Christian. That's Paul, Romans 7. But if there's no desire to hate your sin and to love the Savior, then examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. Well, having spoken then to professing believers here this day, what about for you here this afternoon who make no profession of faith? You make no claim to be a Christian, and so what can I say to you here this day? Well, simply this. God's almighty power to save and to completely transform you is available to you the moment you believe. The moment you believe. Oh, friend, I say, and listen carefully, right now, right here in this place, the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead can raise you from your spiritual dead condition so that you could be freed by the power of God from the dominion of your sins, from the power of your addictions and your enslavement, etc., And all of this if you call upon the mighty Jesus Christ to save you. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 10? He says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Guess what, my dear non-Christian friend? You are a whosoever. You're part of that group. You're a whosoever. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What does the word saved mean? The word saved means to be delivered. Delivered from your sad spiritual condition. Delivered from the reigning power of your sin. Delivered from the blindness that hangs over your eyes, spiritually speaking. Delivered from a multitude of things. Oh, my dear non-Christian friend. There's only one person who could deliver you, and his name is Jesus. And he is willing, able, and ready to do that very thing this day. We have seen many people over the years converted right here in this room, or downstairs, or listening online, whatever the case might be. People saved, delivered. They were once just like you. And guess what? We all were once just like you as well. We were there. We know what it's like. We know what it's like to have a guilty conscience. We know what it's like to sin. We know what it's like to be in the world, lost and without hope, without God. That was all of us at one time. We're no better than anyone here. We're just like you. But God had mercy on us. And through the preaching of the word or the reading of the word or just the hearing of the word, however it came to us, we started hearing about Jesus, the Savior who came into the world, sinners to save. And God tuned our hearts, tuned our hearts toward him. This, this lovely son of God who, who knew no sin but then became sin for us on the cross, who, who 
never did anything wrong before his father in heaven, lived a perfect sinless life, but then in love he, he, he went to the cross and he took the sins of sinners upon himself and he was punished in, in their place for them. And he atoned for their sins 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. He made a, a perfect, a final atonement to his father for the guilty once for all time. And then we heard that if we turn from our sins and put all of our faith in his finished work, we'll be saved, we'll be forgiven, we'll know God. We'll go to heaven at last. And by his grace and power, we repented, we turned from our sins, and we, we trusted in Jesus to be our Savior, our very own Savior. And God saved us. And now with the hymn writer, we say that we are happy all the day. Because being a non-Christian is a miserable thing. It's a miserable thing to be at war with God. To not know God. You can know all kinds of things and all kinds of people and have all kinds of successes, but if you don't know God, you know nothing. You don't even know why you were made. You were made to know God. You're in his world, on his earth, breathing his air, seeing all the things that he made, but you don't even know him. Oh, what a miserable condition. My dear non-Christian friend, know God this day. Turn from your sins, all your secret sins, your lust, your pornography, your pride, your anger, your fornication. Turn from all of it. And know what would be the very best thing for your life. God. 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 He made you for himself. Come to know his best for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you use it for our good. Pray, Lord, that we'll remember as Christians that by virtue of being joined to Christ and being your own, we do have a dynamic at work in us, which is something we've never known. We pray that we would always be aware of this, for that's what Paul would have us to do. And for any hero, oh God, this day who don't know you, might this be the day of their deliverance? Oh God, there is no greater experience in one's life than to be freed, to know you and to love you, and to experience all of the joys of the forgiveness of sins. God, be merciful, we pray. And seal your word to our hearts. We ask and pray these things in that wonderful and glorious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.